Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. You are listening to Keep Canada Weird, a weekly weird news roundup by the Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to Nighttime's weekly Keep Canada Weird discussion series. If you're new here in Keep Canada Weird, my pal Aaron Airport and I seek out and explore some of the more offbeat Canadian news stories from the past week. In tonight's episode, which we recorded on the evening of January 15th, 2023, Aaron and I gaze lovingly at some of Canada's weird wonders. We discuss some fainting goats that have been running errands in BC, We share the latest updates of the cow siege in Quebec. We question the logic of a heroin store being opened in downtown Vancouver. And we take a quick peek at Edmonton's Avatar Guy. Let's get into it. Handsome Aaron Airport. January 15th, 2023. We've had a week of Canada being weird, mischievous, and adventurous. We got to get adventurous, into Adventurous, yeah. It has wow. been an adventurous week. How have you been? Oh, great. How have you been? Uh, let's Be see. Be honest. I've been busy. We, we talked, uh, we got into this a little bit before we started recording, but in a past episode, you talked me into trying to grow a beard. I mm-hmm. let it grow for two weeks. I was absolutely miserable. Literally two of the worst weeks of my life. I was itchy. I was irritated. And I simply couldn't stand that. I've tried everything. I put conditioner on it. I tried like trimming it in the areas that were the itchiest. I've given up. I've buzzed it down to a normal scruff length. And in our next episode, probably this time next week, you will see a clean shaven Jordan on the other end of the yeah, zoom I'm, window. <laughs> I'm really disappointed. I was hoping because I hadn't seen you like I saw you last week on the recording and you know it was really starting to come in like you could see the the beginnings of the beard and then this week I was like I can't wait to see what his beard looks like Mm -hmm. and then you you revealed yourself and I was so disappointed it was an awful way to start this show (laughs) well let's get into it here I don't want to dwell on it we're going to put that behind us we got listener mail we got to get to straight off the bat we got two pieces here. The first one comes in yeah. from Stacy. Let's see what Stacy has to say. Come on, Stacy. Hi, Jordan. Longtime listener, Stacy calling. Um, called in last time regarding the um, the beavers and the cubs. Uh, you guys called me sick, and yeah, I guess I am a little sick. Equals weird sick. Anyhow, uh, the turtle story. So I have a turtle, and it is now 11 years old. Um I shook it in from a friend who didn't want it anymore when it was one and it will outlive me. Um, and they are really easy to take care of. So I don't know why that lady didn't just put it in the bathtub when she cleaned the tank. Cause that's what I do. Anyhow, if you want look on the weather network, they recently posted a story in a video regarding a uh, red eared slider, uh, turtle, like the one that I have that, uh, there's this lake in Ontario where people uh, get rid of them when they get too big. And uh, just on the 13th of January, they posted a story that the firefighters uh, went out and rescued one of them off of a, off of a, a piece of ice. Um, so really, they're okay on their own, too. Anyhow, uh, all the best to you guys. Love listening to all the podcasts. And uh, hello to handsome Aaron Airport as well. Bye-bye. What do you think of this lake where people just throw away their turtles because they've gotten too big or too old? Before we get into it, I just want to say, hello, Stacy. Just so that we can get that out of the way. Yeah, that's there. That's mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Um, that her turtle will outlive her as well, which is something she has to live with. Because these things... I think it's a turtle that needs to live with that reality that the, that oh. the turtle is going to watch their owner pass away. Yeah. And be left alone. Oh, that is pretty dark and sad. But yeah, it's like I'm like a cat or a dog or whatever. Turtles, they li- I guess it probably depends on the race of turtle. But they live for like, you know, 100 years or something they can. Wow. I had turtles as a kid uh, at the height of the Ninja Turtle craze. I don't know what the what kind they were, but they were only as big as like a, a toonie or something. 
You know, mm-hmm. so they were like little things you could fit in your hand. We had them all like in a little cage, my, my sisters and I, and they weren't great pets. They were very delicate. Yeah, you can't cuddle a turtle. No. You could kiss it, I guess. Um, you could pet it with your finger, slimy pets. You, ha- I had a cat and a dog and hamsters as well. You, I, I can't recall you ever having a pet other than your cat currently. Like when back in the day when you lived oh, with your Oh, yeah. Folks. Well, you remember the album I released, Songs for My Cat. Yeah, but do you still have that cat, right? No, that cat. That, that was, God, 25 years ago or okay. whatever. Okay, yeah. That's, <laughs> that time is a blur. Um, yeah, but I, as, a, as a kid, I had hamsters and I had, you know, dogs and cats. And... Did you ever have a hamster escape? Yeah. Yeah, I had. Uh, I was watching. I remember it so clearly. I was watching X Files in at some point in the late '90s, and in my bedroom on my like 12 inch uh, CRT TV, and the TV just shut off. And I'm like, "What the hell?" So I went and I'm like trying to turn it on. It wouldn't turn on, and I'm like, "What's going on here?" And I could smell something a little weird. So I was like, "Whoa, is it like sparking? Like, and where I'm plugged in the wall or something? Maybe it's not plugged in all the way." And when I looked behind the TV, the cord that was going into the TV was just chewed to bits and my hamster mm. was there not alive anymore oh so it was the cord that did it in uh well i'm thinking it was the electrical current that passed through the cord that for whatever sure, reason sure. he got out of the cage and decided to chew on it so but, the hamster wasn't trying to hang itself on the cord it was the electricity that you got it you got it yeah, but it was okay. just kind of a weird a weird time but i've had hamsters since then and I, they live for such a short amount of time it's so sad mm-hmm. the idea of having a turtle that you can spend your life with I, I see uh, the pros and cons to that. The, the pro is certainly that it's, you know, your companion uh, for it life. It will outlive you. Yeah, you'll have it forever. But then on the turtle side of things, it's not, not, a, not a nice thing to yeah, and who's gonna outlive look, the one you love. Who's going to look after it? You're going to drop it off or you, like whoever's dealing with your estate. Well, apparently they'll be it off dropped it off at this, you know, this lake or whatever. <laughs> you know where a firefighter will find you yeah and it's and if it gets stuck on the ice the firefighters will help it oh that's bizarre uh, yeah gotta, why people do that it's it's sad um throwing away animals it's if you if you can't take the responsibility don't take an animal i guess in the in the case of a of a deceased owner and somebody is cleaning out this individual's house after they passed away this person's not going to take their turtle, I wouldn't imagine. I wouldn't either. Um, that's a. I would try and find someone who would want the turtle. Maybe so, that's the way. The next caller is from Miramichi. We when we talked about uh, our, on our year end roundup, we talked about the fact that Miramichi per capita had the highest uh, sales of Tim Hortons coffee. They're phoning regarding that fact. Okay. Hi there, Nighttime Podcast. How is she going? I'm here to weigh in on the Miramichi Tim Hortons discussion and maybe add some context. I'm not from there, but my family is, and the place is basically a second home to me. And I'm also not a coffee drinker, so I have no personal skin in the game. Now, what you should know is that Tim's is basically the only place to get drive through coffee in most of the G. There is a McDonald's down in Douglastown, but people from Newcastle, people from Chatham, people from Napa, and they're not going to drive all the way to D-Town for some Mickey D's coffee. You know, Miramichi is basically several small towns in a trench coat masquerading as a city, so they keep sort of to themselves a little bit insular. Now, there are several smaller cafes scattered throughout the Miramichi, but a lot of them don't do takeout, and I don't think any of them do drive through so if you're looking to get some coffee on your way to work, Tim Hortons is basically your only option. They have only just now gotten a Starbucks, and I'm not sure if it's just soon to be open or if it has only just opened. But either way, you may see those numbers change once that becomes an option for more people. There is also a lot of people that use meth, so that may also be a factor. I don't know. Anyway, if you want to know more about the Miramichi, check out the book Miramichi Murders, Mysteries, and Mayhem by J.A. Morrison. I have no affiliation with the author. It's just a really good book. See ya. <laughs> Do you think a lot of legalities in that in that voicemail of I have no affiliation with yeah. this, I have no affiliation with drink, that. I don't drink coffee, I have no skin you can't in the sue game. me, you can't sue me. <laughs> uh, I don't know if the, the meth is involved with the coffee sales, but if there isn't other drive through places in that area, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. So Tim Hortons is out there, uh, you know, bragging about, oh, Marishi per capita has the, you know, the highest amount of coffee sales, Tim Hortons coffee in the country. And it's like, yeah, the only reason is because there's no other options. 
Mm-hmm. So we'll see when the Starbucks is open, you know, for hopefully most of a year. Then we'll see what the numbers look like next year. Yeah, that will I be. I bet you Mayor Mishi drops pretty quickly down that list. <laughs> I think you're right. Well, we're caught up on mail. Time to get into it here. We got a full house. We're going to be talking about goats, cows, a heroin store, and the avatar guy of Edmonton. I want to start this with... Yeah. Let's go with goats to begin. Yeah, we... When I was reading this article, I was like, wow, we do so many animal stories. <laughs> I know, but this so one, many animal stories. Well, I don't know what's up with that, but when you go searching yeah, for weird what's news happening stories in the, in Canada. with animals, uh, let's show the listeners and let the listeners hear what's going on with the goat man in Vernon, BC. Then we'll chat it out. Mm-hmm. I got a lot to say about this one. Okay. A pair of goats have been the talk of the town in the Okanagan after they've been spotted multiple times, apparently window shopping. The dynamic duo named Lexus and Miata are often seen outside of cafes waiting for their owner, Greg Cotter, in West Kelowna. He trained the pair to follow him into town so they can get some exercise during the winter months. Now, this breed of miniature silky fainting goats are often quite timid, so they need some sense of security. He plans to add two more to his small herd in the spring. First of all, those goats are adorable, but that specific mm-hmm. uh, type of goat, they're called like fainting goats. Have you ever seen yeah. these things in action? I've never seen them in action. I guess they stiffen up or something like when they when they get startled. When or... they're startled, like if you went like say up behind them and you clapped your hands really loud or something, they would, something happens to them when they get startled, they just, all of their muscles lock up and they just fall over. It looks like they fainted. They don't mm-hmm. faint. They just like become so scared that they fall over. And if you look at- I wonder what the evolutionary purpose is for that. Well, it has to be like a glitch or something. I don't know. You or, think it's a glitch? Well, you would think goats, they would, all their evolutionary defense stuff would be to help them not get eaten by like coyotes and wolves and stuff. So if a coyote or a wolf runs into a field of goats and they all just fall on their sides, how is that benefiting the population of goats and in like adding to their chance of survival? I can't think of a reason why or what purpose of, yeah. of stiffening up and falling over would provide a goat in defense yeah. of anything. And the reason I was really one of the reasons I was really excited about this story is my son and I went down like a bit of a rabbit hole on like Instagram not too long ago when we were watching videos of fainting goats and like there was you know this one shot where um, a guy he's at, he has a farm of them so there's like thirty of these things and he's like getting in and starting his truck and all the goats are just like standing in the field next to him and when he starts his his truck the sound of the engine like it startles them and you just see every goat in the field just drop wow <laughs> yeah, and he drives up and then a couple minutes later they get back up as if nothing happened it was like shot from his like home security camera and he uploaded the video mm-hmm. but um but these things they, they say in in the clip there the, the man who's taking them downtown in bc he says they're um you know, just kind of like like meek kind of animals, and they just kind of walk behind them and follow them around. They're kind of like a great pet, almost like like a, a dog. You, you'll see like there's in my neighborhood, there's this older man who has this old dog. And when every time I see them, I'm just kind of impressed because the dog's never on a leash. The old man's just walking with his head down and the dog is walking behind him with its head down. And you can tell these two don't spend a minute apart ever. Sure, yeah. But I mean, my thoughts on it is that you should always, regardless if your dog is tame or docile or, you know, friendly to every living creature, mm-hmm. you always have to have your dog on a leash, right? Yeah. And with goats, you know, I, it's, I, I think it's fine for him to be bringing the goats around, but he should throw a leash on them, I think. <laughs> would you leash a goat? That would look even weirder, I think. I think it looks weird that it's weirder that they're not leashed yeah and, and, and it, then it just looks like there are wild goats following him but downtown yeah if he, <laughs> if he has them leashed then it's like oh this guy has pet goats and he brings them everywhere how mm. adorable or it's like 
does that guy have hot dogs in his pocket and these does goats he, are following yeah, like, him? Does he the even know they're right behind him? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Is he going to get scared stiff and fall over? Yeah, and I guess the goats, so these fainting goats, they see him kind of as the alpha, so they don't even walk in front of him. They're always behind him. I've watched behind a few him. news articles and photos and stuff of this guy. Uh, he's an older kind of man, uh, doesn't stand out in any specific way other than the fact that he has these goats. But in one of the videos I saw, he's walking downtown with the two goats at his heels and he opens the store and goes in a coffee shop and the two goats just stand there right at the door, like patiently waiting for their master to come back, which it's kind of sweet. And it's a, I'd be worried about someone stealing my goats if I was leaving them out there. Hmm. I guess that's a reasonable fear because they're probably not worse tied up or I don't know. I would I'd be a little nervous about them getting stolen, especially after all this news coverage. You could see somebody being like, oh, I'm going to steal those goats on that old man. Well, we had <laughs> what did we talked about them. just recently. Was it the sheep that got stolen and found, they found it at a Tim Hortons? Yeah, yeah. People, like, people do dumb people stuff. People will steal anything. And when you draw attention to these goats that follow him around and they wait outside of stores i could see somebody kind of getting a kick out of the fact i'm going to steal them and hold them for ransom and send him you know ransom notes that are cut out of newspapers and magazines um yeah i don't know i don't know where this what what the issue is if as long as the goats are well behaved and he's willing to take the risk of someone running off with his goat. Can you eat a goat? I was thinking about this earlier. I've heard of eating lamb, but do you eat goat? Like, could someone eat his goats? Um, I'm sure you can eat goat. Why not? Yeah, I just don't recall a dish where it's like goat, but I think of goat. lamb. Yeah, I don't. Lamb I don't. I mean, there's goat cheese. Uh, they, they chop the goat up and make cheese out of it. Yeah, they chop it up <laughs> so fine. <laughs> <laughs> so cheesy, that goat looks. Uh, speaking of cheesy... I want to get into the next story. Um, the biggest movie in the world appears to be in theaters right now, although I don't haven't heard anything about it. It's, I'm talking about James Cameron's Avatar Part 2. Avatar 1 came out, it seems like, 100 years ago, and that was a huge blockbuster. It was IMAX, 3D, it broke all these sales records. And then I just kind of heard nothing about it until I found this story and I'm just now learning that there is a part two that is like the most expensive movie ever made and it's expected to break all the records. Are you planning to go see Avatar? Does it mean anything to you? Do you give a damn? Uh, I thought you were being sarcastic when you were saying you didn't hear anything about it. No, I, I honestly didn't. I had really? No, I had I, no idea. Yeah, I heard about it and, and I have zero desire to see it. I saw the first one. It was good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, visually, it was interesting, mm -hmm. you know, in 3D and, and you're seeing how revolutionary the visuals were in that movie. The story did nothing for me. It, mm -hmm. I, I found the story was just a placeholder for the visuals, yeah, for the special exactly. effects. It was, it was there was no point where I was like, wow, what an interesting story. It was kind of cliche, the story I found. Yeah, I so agree. I really had no I have no I'm not a special effects kind of person i'm not someone who goes to see a movie just because it's going to have really innovative special effects in it yeah in, in fact i found the special effects kind of took away some of my enjoyment i saw it in imax and it was 3d which was weird because i had to wear the glasses and it was like that thing where it's a higher frames per second so the motion is smoother and i found it just looked kind of like too real or something it freaked me out but what i did enjoy about avatar is not long after avatar came out originally i went to florida to like disney world and there was a section of the park that was avatar themed and that was some pretty wild stuff it was really cool there and i liked the disney avatar stuff much more than the movie itself but right. We're not here to discuss the movie. We're here to discuss a man in Edmonton who made the decision to basically build his life around the first Avatar movie. So it's pretty fair to say that there is not another Canadian or another person listening to this show that are half as excited about the new movie as Edmonton's Avatar guy. Here's what's going on with him. Okay. And with the new movie out today, you could argue there's no one in the world more excited to see it than this Edmonton man. Raymond Knowles fell in love with the first film when it was released in 2009, so much so he shaped almost his entire life around it. 
95% of his body is tattooed with Avatar images. His business is named Mr. Avatar Carpentry, and his truck is covered in Avatar decals. Tonight, he is seeing the sequel. I can't pinpoint it down to one thing. There's so much about it. Um, I'm a Cameron fan in the, from the beginning, and this one here was just over the top. And now that uh, the second one's finally here, got goosebumps just thinking about it, so I can't wait to see it tonight. Noel says he saw the first Avatar movie in theaters nine times in two weeks. He's bringing his daughter to tonight's showing. I think the the tattoos are, are too far, but naming your business after it and then yeah. taking your business truck and covering it in as many and avatar avatar related decals. pictures yeah just like your body <laughs> yeah. and even like on his truck like the font and stuff is the same font that the movie uses that's just pretty wild this man it says is. he says i was a cameron fan from the beginning just off the top of your head what else has james cameron did, done he's done titanic right titanic um did he do and the then he Abyss? did that he did that uh ocean documentary that you see in IMAX is one of the early IMAX documentaries. I think it was called Oceans. Okay. I saw it recently, actually. Oh, and James Cameron is a Canadian filmmaker. Mm -hmm. That's but right. I think he's more associated with the U.S. for whatever reason. Maybe just because his movies are probably... Oh, he did Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Oh, right. Yeah, which is a great movie. And he did uh, The Abyss as well, which is a water-related movie, which is probably... I could understand covering your body in Terminator 2 tattoos more than Avatar tattoos. Absolutely. And you can name your company like I'll be back or I won't need to be back Carpentry because like Right, it's right. Perfect. Because it's done right the first time. Yeah. yeah, and when you send the bill it would say like judgment day and you know and then you'd have to fill out mm -hmm, and pay the mm -hmm. bill. Um Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, that makes more sense. See, like with Avatar, the biggest issues that I had with the movie was the characters although again were visually stunning that they weren't memorable characters like we i could i can understand someone who's obsessed with star wars mm -hmm. and gets star wars tattoos all over their body um you know there's there's so many classic blockbuster movies that you can relate to someone wanting to cover their bodies in tattoos or they're naming their business after it but Avatar, I, I can't get on board with that. Hmm. Again, it's all special effects. There's not a lot of meat to the to the story and the characters. So and, how, how do you connect with this movie in that way? Yeah, and the style of it, like the f creatures and stuff that he has tattooed all over his body. It's not a very cool look. It's a little weird. Um, but, but he does, I found another article with this man that was done a couple of years. It was done right after the movie. Uh, a little bit after the first movie came out so this is i don't know like six or seven years old and in the early news report he gives some background on why he connects with the story so much and he relates it a bit to the um the treatment of indigenous people in canada i'm going to play that clip and maybe this will fill in some of the blanks on what his motivation is i think about two months after the movie came out i figured i'd get my first tattoo i've never had tattoos all my life and that was probably the first one i've got and then I just kept on adding, 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 and eventually I'm at where I'm at now. Well, I loved everything about the movie and I loved all James Cameron's uh, movies in general. So this one here hit me more than most of them. So I figured I'd do this tribute type thing for the best movie I've ever seen. The truck is just the start and uh, I'll keep on driving it around, showing it off. And one of these days it might mean something to somebody. Like just for example, the beginning of the movie, it reminds me of Fort Mac with all the heavy machinery. Uh, driving out the uh, indigenous, um, the same uh, thing going on here, destroying the planet, uh, strip mining. It's governments going in, taking over the the people's lands for profit. James Cameron put that in the movie. It made it so similar to what uh, our own real planet is. It made it look so realistic. It's hit me on so many levels. I have different reactions. Uh, some love it. Some intrigued. Some saying I'm crazy, uh, obsessed. I don't know if you want to call it obsessed, but I just love everything about it, and I'm just willing to show it off. No, we definitely want to call it obsessed. Yeah. That is what it is. Yeah, I'm intrigued. I think he's a little crazy, and I certainly think he's a bit obsessed. Oh, he's as obsessed as one can get with anything. Yeah. 
But that that message that he sees in the movie, I can understand that. The, like when you yeah, look at that, that story, but it's sure. Um, and that message is there in the movie. It's it's obvious that message. Everybody got that message from that movie. When you watch it, it that hits you over the head. That message that of of you know companies destroying the environment for profit and mm -hmm. and th those relationships that we have to the environment. It it's. It's very evident in that film, and and I got that from it. We all got that from it. And there's a lot of other stories that tell that same story. So why Avatar? Why did Avatar grab this man in a way when other stories haven't? Mm -hmm. To the point where he's going to tattoo his entire body and name his carpentry company after it. Would Would you be a little freaked out if you hired a carpenter and they showed up in an Avatar truck covered in Avatar tattoos? If his Yelp reviews were good, I wouldn't have any problem with it. Okay, because that is a, a, going to be a weird segue to the next story I want to get into here. Lately, I've gone down this rabbit hole of watching this certain guy on YouTube. He's an Australian plumber, and he has a business called, uh, I think his name of his business is like Drains Go. And what he does is, he's not like a plumber that would go in your house and replace your pipes. His specialty is unclogging clogged pipes. In every YouTube video he makes um, is just him going to a house and unclogging whatever complicated thing they have going on. And he uses a variety of tools and he's talking to the camera and narrating, you know, what he's doing as he does his work. But one thing that always happens is um, in a cool moment in all of his videos, his, his YouTube channel is called The Drain Addict. And anyone who ever watches him, I think, will love him. But uh, one of the things that always comes up is he brings these this cast of characters called the the, uh, the Drain Gang. And they're all these toys that he has. So it's like a rat and a cockroach and all these different animals. And before he starts the video, he puts them all over the property of the host, the home he's going to be working on. And as he's working, he's always checking in with, you know, the rat and the cockroach and the crocodile. And a lot of times when you're watching it, you see the the homeowner in the background and you'll see the homeowner just being like, this guy is nuts. Um, and it, just when I watched the Avatar Man, I thought a little bit of this Australian plumber who is also quite eccentric, but good at his work. And like you said, if you're good enough, you can be crazy and eccentric. And people... Sure. As long as you've got the reviews and the track record to, to prove that your work is good. Yeah, you can cover your truck in whatever you want to cover it in. That's right. Um, but the reason this served as a segue is there was a, an interesting public service announcement, I guess, coming out of Mission BC related to things that should and should not be flushed down sewer systems and the reason for this uh, release is related to um, uh, an expensive clog they had to they had to deal with the city had to deal with so let me read it to you and we'll talk a bit about this the city of mission bc has issued an unusual reminder to its residents don't flush clothing down the toilet over the holidays public works crews discovered that a pair of sweatpants had caused a major clog in one of the city's sewers the city said in a social media post on Wednesday. To end up here, the clothing would likely have been flushed down the toilet. In a statement, the city said its workers have removed many items from its sewer systems that didn't belong there over the years, including food wrappers, dental floss, diapers, and food scraps. The city said crews quickly got to work removing the sweatpants and repairing the damage they caused, but the latest incident serves as a good reminder that only human waste and toilet paper should be flushed. Mission BC, the city, concluded its statement with the following list of items to flush the following list of items not to flush down the toilet or put down the drain. So these are the repeat offenders of things people are putting in toilets that are causing problems for the city sewer system or even the homeowner's sewer systems. So baby wipes or flushable wipes, when you know what they are, it's oh yeah, those yeah. awful things. Uh, feminine hygiene products. Bandages and wrappers, condoms and wrappers. Anything to say about that or should I go on? What would I have to say about I just condoms feel, and wrappers? I feel, I saw like your aura is usually like this soft blue and it just started <laughs> flashing yellow and I could sense yeah. uh, on a supernatural level that okay, you had a well, reaction. Okay, well, my only reaction to it is I am guilty of that. Not now, but in the past. Okay. All right. Um, so let's move on. Swabs and Q-tips. I could not imagine flushing a Q-tip. Dental floss. Why not just throw it in the garbage? 
uh, diapers. This one, as a father of two children, I wish you could fl you could flush diapers down the toilet. But those things, uh, <laughs> I've I've accidentally put diapers in my washing machine, my clothes washer, a few times. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> like you'll take a, like I'll like change my kids before bed, and he'll have like a clean diaper on, and it when they're clean and like dry, they're like small, so you don't really notice it in his pants. And then I'll throw his pants in the wash, and then when you go to take the wash out of the wash the diaper has gone from like weighing like you know an eighth of a pound to like 15 pounds of like water oh, yeah. <laughs> the absorbency power of a diaper sucking up all that water in the machine um coffee grounds fruit stickers that's pretty specific i guess they're talking about like the little sticker on an the apple stickers like on a banana yeah um in the last one on their list is vitamins supplements and medications and I think that is because of science fiction. Like if you flush like weird medicines and vitamins and supplements down to the sewer, there's going to be something evolutionary that's going to be. Tipped. I see that more as people cleaning out their medicine cabinets and just dumping it down the toilet and flushing it. Why would you do that? Well, why would we do anything that we do there's so many let's go back to the big why is the jogging pants so yeah good point <laughs> i'm not convinced that they were flushed i, I think don't... there has to i has to because there's no way you're flushing jogging pants down any standard toilet that i know about yeah i've been in some weird buildings where you like flush and it's almost like powered it's like like kind of like on an airplane maybe that could suck a pair of jogging pants down but yeah it seems like i don't buy it it would have to be a baby's jogging pants like i, I can't see how that could possibly go down a drain um, no no it, it like, i can it... see the scenario of somebody craps their pants in a mcdonald's mm. and they just want to get rid of the evidence well and not leave it there but but that's um, an interesting point because when I think of those like powered toilets where you flush them and it's like loud and almost kind of scary mm -hmm. like there's a jet engine, that's usually at like a restaurant or some kind of commercial place, a mall or a fast food joint. So maybe your theory of someone wanting to hide evidence of something embarrassing, maybe you're onto something. But aren't there other ways into these sewers and pipes? Like somebody might have been down there. Mm. And getting changed for a wedding. <laughs> and I can't wear these jogging pants to a wedding. I need to put on a tuxedo or a suit and tie. And, the, and this is all happening in the sewer system. And I crap my pants. <laughs> yeah, that's also, I guess, plausible. Yeah, it's a, it's a perfect storm of, of, of things happening to this person. I, th I think the sewer system is pretty, like, enclosed, though. And I, I don't know if... It would be easy to end up in a situation where you're amongst flowing sewage, changing for a wedding, in or. But somebody's got to be able to get down there and leave their jogging pants. Yeah, and they're putting it in like an, an employee of Mission BC's like wastewater treatment center, and they're putting it on Joe Public by setting up yeah, this maybe condescending it's, maybe list. Maybe it's yeah, maybe this guy it's his pants, and then he's <laughs> down there with his boss doing an inspection is like whose jogging pants are these yeah. are people flushing jogging pants he's like oh yeah they must be flushing jogging but i don't know how <laughs> else they would have gotten here when that guy's living down there because his wife threw him out yep that's got it so he had to get changed for a wedding so he had to take his jogging pants off and put his tuxedo on mystery solved yeah we nailed that one we see you we see you uh public relations person mm -hmm. yeah face the truth come on out <laughs> you know let's let's hear the real story here don't be a coward let's move on to the next story we were a bit cowardly when faced with the idea of a group of cows um organizing in laying siege to a small town in Quebec, and from there, likely the world. Um, Aaron, if that story freaked you out, if you were nervous, if you were worried, you can rest easy. Let me tell well, you. I was cool. very supportive of the cows when we covered that originally, when yeah. that story first broke. Yes, that's true. So maybe... I wanted the cows to take over the world and take what's theirs. Yeah, well. Come and get it. 
you're not going to like this follow-up and this update in the story, this development. The remaining fugitive cattle that had been on the lamb in central Quebec since July were finally recaptured over the weekend, bringing an end to an unusual saga that has involved cowboys and covert nighttime operations. And I'm reading that from an article, covert nighttime operations. I almost feel like that's a shout out to us and a way to pull us into the story. But sure, it, sure. anyway, they've co- been listening. They've been listening. Yeah. The last three cattle that escaped from a farm last summer were rounded up Saturday night and returned the next day to their owner. Quebec's farmers union said on Monday, I don't think we'll <laughs> soon see 24 cows gone for nearly six months. A spokesperson said in an interview, we said it would take patience. It makes no sense to chase after the cows. It was the cows that had to come back to us. The remaining three cattle, including a calf, were recaptured last weekend with the use of supervised feeding areas around which fences were gradually installed, the same tactic used to round up the other animals in late November and early December. The Farmers Union said in December that one of its captured one of its capture operations was conducted quietly at night so that onlookers wouldn't compromise their plan. All the animals are visibly in good health, Dubé said, adding that the cattle that were returned before last weekend were all readjusting to life back in captivity. Union officials said they will debrief and try to determine who is responsible for tracking and capturing future runaway farm animals. Mm -hmm. So they're all home. Just a minor setback in the cow's overall plan. Uh, Yeah. Just a minor temporary setback. This was round one and cows live to fight another day. You know what? It might even be part of the plan. I think the original escape was a reconnaissance mission mm. where it's like, let's just go and 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 map the areas and, and, we'll, and we'll go for a few months and we'll figure out what's around. We'll get a feel for everything, what we can get away with, what we're going to need. We'll, we'll make a list of, of, of what's necessary to accomplish this mission. So now they're back, and they're back by their own choices, their own free will. Mm-hmm. So the because cows... if they if they didn't want to get caught, they wouldn't have got caught. Yeah, because just... the cow is smarter than the human. And he says so in that article. He says it was we weren't going to capture the cows. We were, it would take the cows to come back to us. Yeah, and so the cows came back he... on their own. So he may know damn well what's going on, or at least fear it. Oh, he fears it. He knows. He knows. We um, all know. Come on. Let's yeah. just submit to this. And there's another layer to this story where there, we had talked about before. There were lawsuits filed against the owner of the firm for other people's loss of income and loss of materials as a result of his firm's laying, laying siege to their properties. So it'll also be interesting to see the legal fallout when that time comes. Mm-hmm. But um, who's who's representing the cows in this in this legal procession mm, that's a good point who's looking out for the cows and the answer is the cows are looking out for the cows mm-hmm. and soon you will hear from the cows yeah. you will hear from all of them you'll know when they're coming to get theirs yeah and it won't happen in a courtroom no no there's there's only one courtroom that the cows care about yeah. that's and justice is carried out in the wild it's on the tip of their horns cows have horns yeah right? yeah uh, i think the male uh, ones Let's end this conversation. <laughs> we go. All right. Let's. Uh, We're going to expose how much we really know about cows. <laughs> they have cows. They have horns, right? Um, I don't know. They have milk in them. The next story. We'll go out on this one. This is a really interesting take on a social problem. This involves a man who, on the downtown east side of Vancouver, which is. Um, kind of like ground zero for social issues in Canada, be it people living with homelessness, drug addiction, untreated mental health issues, human trafficking, all of this stuff lives and breathes on the Lower East Side of Vancouver. Um, One issue that comes up a lot is tainted drugs killing addicts or injuring them. And a man who's brother died as a result of a drug uh, overdose is taking some unusual steps to address the issue and in the process of doing so he is uh i would say he's knocking on the door of law enforcement here's what's going on a vancouver man wants to open up his own store not to sell groceries or clothing 
but hard drugs. He's well aware it's a risky move, but hopes his shop will reduce the number of people dying of overdoses. As Tamina Aziz reports, his lawyer believes the law will be on his side. Jerry Martin is a former drug addict. Now sober, he wants to open up his own brick and mortar shop to sell hard drugs, including heroin, cocaine, and meth. It takes the extreme to get things done sometimes. He recently lost his brother due to overdose and says there's a need to provide a safe supply. You know, a lot of these people, in fact, all of them, they have to take a risk every day where they go get their drugs. They're either going to get something that isn't clean or safe, or they can put themselves in a dangerous situation. There's a lot of predators out there that'll get girls to do things for their drugs, whether they got the money or not, and they'll put them in a situation. And I don't think it's very comfortable for anyone. So they can come in there and not have to worry about that. He's been sober for 15 years and hopes through education, future customers will eventually get clean too. For the people out there that think it's a really bad idea, you want to look at it from the user's angle and the family of that user. While it's currently not legal to sell these drugs, his lawyer says there's a possibility it could be in the near future. Vancouver is a very progressive part of the country and might sound strange in other parts of the country, but uh, yeah, Vancouver is also suffering through a terrible uh, opioid scourge and it's really uh, it's opioid poisoning is what's going on. People are dying. Um, so it's a huge problem. Safe supply would address that. More than 1,800 people died from illicit drug use last year, according to the latest findings by BC's Corner Service. So we would argue that the, the law is arbitrary because it's making people less safe, not more safe. Martin says he gets his supply tested and deems it safe and vows he'll be selling it in Vancouver's downtown east side this weekend from his trailer even if it means he could get arrested. I'm not too worried. I think I'll probably get bail. He says it's worth the risk if it means saving someone's life. Tamina Aziz, CTV News, Vancouver. That guy's on a mission, and I don't know how that's going to end for him. I don't imagine that... Um, I, I can't imagine that you can just open up a store that sells heroin and opioids and such to people downtown, but... I understand his, like the need for something like that. Maybe not the need, but I, I can understand the positives to a spot where you can get a safe supply. But I'm also thinking what qualifies him? Well, um, he's not that's, buying it that's, from Shoppers Drug Mart, I'm sure. He says he's testing it when, when he brings in his supply. He tests his supply to make sure that it's safe. That's a good point what is his scientific background like he talks about how he was an addict himself and he has that level of experience to this but i'm sure there needs to be more regulatory yeah practices in place for something like this certainly i i think uh, i see this more as an act of activism and making a statement and making a point if something like this were going to happen it would need to be heavily regulated, closely monitored, um, appropriate security and, you know, everything would need to be on the up and up. If, if in Canada, they're going to allow people to sell hard drugs to addicts. But then again, right, especially if somebody buys meth or cocaine or whatever hard drug it is from him and then overdoses on. Yeah, that, exactly. They could that's going to be a huge issue for this guy. Yeah. And, and he certainly doesn't have insurance. And then there's also the issue of you have a brick and mortar store that has inventory inside of hard drugs. People are going to want to break into that store repeatedly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked last week about the guy who broke into the grocery store for butter tarts. Yes. <laughs> so that's happened twice. You know, that same guy went in and broke into the store twice with those butter tarts. So imagine you have a store with cocaine and meth and heroin. How many times is his store going to get broken into? Exactly. So security, how is he going to monitor? How is he going to afford to keep up with that? That's going to be, that's going to be, there's a lot of problems with his plan. I, I think he is highlighting an issue, but I think his approach to how he's handling it is simply seen. I simply see it as a act of activism and going yeah. out there and proving a point. But I don't think, I don't think he should be selling heroin downtown this guy well I, i'd be surprised if this thing got off of you know got on its feet but 
Um, well, it his plan was to do it this weekend. We're recording this Sunday evening. As of now, I've been looking for any news updates and articles provi- providing some information on what happened, if he actually went through with it. I haven't found anything yet, but it's, I, if he did open the store and started selling heroin to people, I'm sure we'll have an update by next week. And I have a feeling that update will be he was arrested and the police now will have all of his heroin. Yeah, that's 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 a great possibility. Um, but, but yeah, I, I see the point of it. I see what he's trying to do. I support that. I think the idea that, you know, people should have a safe place to get these drugs so that they're not ingesting toxic chemicals and and yeah, but it God also knows what else yeah but it all should should be hand in hand with like social outreach and services to help them uh get out of addiction like i think if if someone is going to be selling heroin to heroin addicts in downtown vancouver it should be sold specifically with the intention of like keeping them safe while you get them off of it so it would need to be something done hand in hand with social services and uh, in like kind of social outreach to help it be effective to actually get the people off of uh, off of the drug that they're addicted to. And when we hear like in that article, he says like, you know, through education, I'm hoping, you know, to help people quit. But what but quali- the liquor store doesn't do that. Yeah. And also what qualifies him? Is, is <laughs> yeah. he just going to try to talk to people and let them know? Right. It's that's a complicated question. But if you go to the liquor store, they're not trying to get you off booze when you go in there. Well, I'm sure that not actively, but probably passively. Like, I'm sure there's flyer like there's probably be signs and stuff about, you know, don't drink and drive. It's a very and, minimal. I mean, the staff there and, the, and and none of them are you don't have a staff of, like of social qualified workers. social workers working the registers at the liquor store yeah uh, or in the the dispensary section but obviously right. m- uh, marijuana and alcohol is very different than heroin and opioids well i would such. argue that alcohol is just as dangerous as a lot of these drugs are. well uh, here in nova scotia i know a hell of a lot more people who've had their lives destroyed by alcohol than yeah. opioids but that said, I've met a few who had problems with that. It's just the prevalence. Yeah, of- yeah. Any any drug has its addictive capabilities that can mm-hmm. ruin lives. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't take alcohol out of the ballpark of of methamphetamines and yeah. cocaine and or scratch tickets for that matter. Scratch tickets or butter tarts. Um, I'm glad you said butter tarts. We just got a, a piece of mail that came in while we were talking, and now I have a chance to read it. Someone sent me a message that said, my mother was born in Halifax long ago, moved to the States in her 20s. I've never heard of butter tarts, but when I listened to your story, I had to look up a recipe and try them. I couldn't find them for sale locally here in New York. They were wonderful, and they're my new favorite. I wonder what other Canadian secrets that my mother kept hidden from me. I do know of at least one family secret, but she carried it to her grave. And then they made a winky symbol. Okay. Um, when you think of a Canadian treat, so this is an American that has been missing out on butter tarts her whole life. Uh, we set her right that uh, on that. When I, I was thinking, um, just as we were talking there, of other Canadian treats that maybe she's missing out on, are oat cakes prevalent outside of Canada, or is that a Canadian thing? I don't know about oat cakes. Okay. If, if you haven't had an oat cake, maybe that's a Canadian thing. Try an oat cake. I recommend dipping it in your coffee. That's my favorite way to eat them. Well, the coffee crisp is a Canadian, yeah, bar, candy right? bar. But that's not something mm. you can cook yourself. And oat no, cake, no, you can, but you can find. You can a, ask a Canadian friend to mail you some. We should work. Out, uh, should we be sending food internationally? Um, if we should, maybe we can work out something with listeners where we can send them like uh, coffee crisps. A or, coffee crisp in or, exchange for a review of it. Like you'd have to come on the show. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay, or listen, I'll put that uh, or out there. some kind of a awful tim hortons product that we could send them um yeah i uh, know i wouldn't do them harm i would send them coffee i wouldn't crisps, do though. them harm yeah or, or ketchup yeah, chips point. is another one that ketchup chips but the coffee thinking. crisp is a, is such a great bar that yeah. i was shocked when i found out that 
They didn't have them in other countries. Yeah, they're missing out big time. And it's not just for coffee lovers. My kids both love coffee. Oh, coffee curse is one of my favorite bars. It's Mm -hmm. incredible. Um, Nanaimo bars is another big, like uniquely Canadian sweet that you. That's can a hard one to ship though, because. Uh... But they, could, but she could make it at home if she made butter. Yes, yeah, so she could make it. Yeah. She could make oat cakes and Nanaimo bars and and a poutine, like a basic poutine, where you put cheese curds or shred mozzarella cheese over French fries and pour gravy over it. That's also fairly Canadian, but I guess poutine is common around the world now. Yeah, I think it's common enough. People know what it is. It's also the recipe is as simple as it gets. But I don't yeah. even know why it's a thing. But um, we quickly transitioned from cocaine and, and meth to coffee crisp and poutine. So well, you can tell what our vices are. Yeah, yeah. Our our addictions lie in other realms. Oh, man. Oat cakes destroyed years of my life. That's all yeah. I did in high school was eat oat cakes. I still get effed up on the crisp <laughs> what about actually if you want to talk about foods that were uh destroying lives it, you and i both had uh an issue with hot turkey sandwiches. oh hot turkey sandwiches <laughs> yeah i remember uh, and i was your gateway into hot turkeys i remember we were i think we were at athens restaurant in halifax mm-hmm. and i was ordering a hot turkey and you had never had one before and i had suggested yeah you should yes. try it i was whatever. like my grandfather likes these i'm not getting in hot turkeys yeah anymore. and you i remember how blown away you were by it yeah and i've eaten them like it's i find it's the, a great way to check the temperature of a restaurant if you go in a restaurant if they have a hot turkey sandwich on the menu you get that and if they do it right the restaurant's good if they don't do it right you know everything mm. else is crap it's it's been a while since i've had a hot turkey though well that was a part when we pl- were actively playing in our band airport a big pre-show ritual talk about like true rock stars a pre-show ritual would be you and i would get hot turkey sandwiches somewhere yeah, which is awful for a singer to do right before a show is <laughs> load up on a hot turkey sandwich. They're delicious. But they're so heavy. It's so much turkey and gravy and bread. Yeah, but that should have Just, been a post-show thing, I guess. It should have been, yeah. You know, well, that's exhausted funny. from the show. Yeah. Let's have a hot turkey. But no, before the show, that way you can puke on stage. <laughs> um, on that note, let's wrap this up. Actually, I should say you can puke in a toilet and flush it. They said in, in the ad, uh, the article I read, they said it should be human waste, including, they said even puke will take puke. So uh, you could. Well, puke I hope so. Sure. Where else are we going to puke? Yeah, seriously. Ugh. Come on. Um, let's wrap this up. Aaron, until next time. Jordan, until next time. Um, watch out for the cows. They're Can't watching. Get enough of that coffee crisp. I want to thank you for helping Aaron and I in our Keep Canada Weird discussion. But let us also call out to you for even further support. If something unusual happens in your town, please let us know. And the best way to let us know is by sending a voice memo through nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. We'd really like to hear from you. Now, before we part, let me give some thanks. First, a big thanks to Aaron for sharing another evening with me and with you, the listeners of Nighttime. A shout out to the internet's favorite cult leader, Unicole, who supplies this series' intro and outro voiceovers. And lastly, but most importantly, a massive thank you to everyone who listens to Nighttime, as it's without your interest and your support that this show would be impossible. But with that said, keeping the show alive is and has always been an uphill battle. So if you want to help take a bit of weight off the show's back, please consider subscribing to the premium feed. And not only does the premium feed fund the creation of the show, it'll give you more of each topic than you'll find here on the free feed, as I'm adding exclusive content regularly and maintain a full back catalog of episodes only on the premium feed. So for about the price of a cup of coffee, you can help keep the show alive at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And with that said, let me thank the newest subscribers, Jerry and Kate. Thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't do it by way of a premium feed subscription, you can give us a big hand by simply sharing this episode on social media and letting like-minded friends know what we're doing here. If you have any story ideas, want to get feedback on the show, or have anything else you want to say at all, you can do that at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. Again, we hope to hear from you. But until then, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let us know if you see anything weird. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. 
Copyright, Jordan Bonaparte.